Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna play a video. Uh, it, but Alex is there, so if you have questions, we can pause and take them in line, or uh, preferably wait till the end, and we'll collect them then. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk about uh, bringing network and time together using Linux tracing. My name is Alexander Arang. I work uh, at Red Hat on the Linux kernel distributed log manager, which is mainly used by um, GFS2. It's a cluster file system, and it's using DLM uh, log manager to control mutual access to a shared block device between different machines. So what you can expect from this talk? You can expect uh, that I give you a very short in, uh, introduction into time synchronized traces, what that means and how you can get them in Linux. Then I will show you the software which I'm using for visualization, visualize the distributed log manager protocol, which is a networking protocol, the exchange. Um, messages and machines which using these logs getting into different states. You can see that very easily on this in a timely manner on a uh, graphical viewer. Therefore, we're using software like TraceCMD, which is the official upstream user space tool for the Linux tracing subsystem. Then we're using um, Slog2 SDK, which is uh, written in Java tracing framework originally for MPI applications. I'm not sure if you are familiar with MPI. MPI is messing passing interface. It's uh, the boost library has an implementation of it. It is uh, for, it's mainly used for vector computing and such things, but this log2 SDK, it's not depending on MPI. Um, it's just a tracing framework to visualizing traces. Then in what I developed is a DLM to slog2. That's a trace converter. It's making the bridge between TraceCMD and slog2 SDK that we can see Linux traces in this graphical view of slog2. So however, um, using slog2 is uh, SDK is optional. That's a, a piece which is a module which you can put out of it. And uh, DLM is only a application example here. You can use your networking uh, protocol or something like that if you see that it's matched and then you can do something similar. Now we're having uh, pipeline steps. Pipelines uh, is at first, uh, we record some Linux traces, then we converting them to slog2 and then finally in the third state, we want to view them in a graphical way. So at first recording, we're using TraceCMD, which produces several Linux trace files. Then uh, we're having the tool DLM2 to slog2, which converts those traces to slog2. And then we're having a viewer, which can open slog2 trace files, which is named JumpShot. But how uh, does slog2 visualizing traces? So we have different topologies. One is events, and we have a timeline. A timeline goes shows the time from the past to the future, and we're having events like this thing here, and it has a timestamp. So, and um, this thing is the topology event, which is uh, visualized as a pin needle. You see here the pin and then the needle on the timeline. And it requires to show our event, uh, one timestamp and one line ID. The line ID is the timeline ID. I will show you later what it really means. Um, so these events, uh, they can be one-to-one -one map to trace events because they having a timestamp and then the line ID you get, uh, you, you only need to provide it on which timeline it will be shown up. So we have another topology, which is states. That's uh, on a timeline as well. There's a rectangle, which uh, symbolizes states. And the state um, has a ta start time stand and an end time stand. In this interval, 
you can see that this uh, specific stage happens on this timeline over this time. And it requires two timestamps, as I mentioned, and on one line ID. By putting things together, we can build something like a Gantt diagram. We have line IDs, which is, which is uh, to specify the timeline. You have several pin needles on it and also rectangle. And then we're coming to the third topology, which is a arrow topology. And our arrow topology can symbolize a message ex exchange between timelines. So for arrow, you need uh, two timestamps and two line IDs. And uh, you have also a legend, which is uh, which where you can see which each color uh, has a specific meaning and uh, what this specific meaning means. So, but uh, let's get into tracing as uh, I want to give you a little bit about um, local tracing without multi ma machines in a network. So what, what I show you here is that in the reality, um, the, the clocks this, um, are more complex than um, what I showed here. There's a per CPU clock and something like that. But the clocks which I show here are more shown as TriCMD user. And then you're having a PC with a specific clock. I think it's default the uptime of Linux, which uh, TriCMD uh, Linux tracing uses. And um, then you have several events coming up uh, over uh, over the time from the past to the future. And then it can also record it into a trace record file. But what means sign uh, time synchronized tracing. In time synchronized uh, synchronized tracing, you have um, like in this example three machines, and uh, those machines are numbered. Like in a cluster, machines are nodes, and uh, they have node ID and one one two three, and each machine has a different clock um, because when you see for example, the uptime, they are not started at the same time. So time synchronized traces means that you have a global clock D, which uh, is a different uh, time source. And each of uh, the time clocks for, of each machine will be synchronized with this clock, uh, global clock. For example, here the, um, in the machine ID 1, node ID 1, the offset is close to zero, then it shows up like um, on this. Um, it's, the offset is relative to the clock D, and it shows up like this. But when we have some an offset which is more in the future, then uh, it will be shown up more in the future. And then when you have the offset negative, it will be shown up in the past. Uh, the reason why uh, we do that is um, to get a timeline where everything was uh, is in a chronological order as it happens. And this is our goal to um, to reach here. And then they are finally time synchronized. So trace CMD time synchronization. Uh, how you can do that with trace CMD is you have a, uh, you have your three machines here. Um, with clock A, B, C on the machine A, uh, one, two, three. And you need to call trace CMD agent on all machines which are running there. And on your third machine, which is more uh, a controlling machine, you start your trace CMD record command with minus A, one, two, three. That's uh, usually um, an address. It can be a VSOC or a P address. And then with minus E, you can also add some filter, filtering. Also, what you can choose is the time synchronization protocols that can be also be done with KVM or PTP. Uh, and your socket communication, what you want to use, either IP communication or over a VSOC. Um, if the general rule here is if you have Virtual machines just use KVM and VSOCs. 
and everything else on a real machine use PGP and IP because you cannot use them in a, um, in a, on a real uh, machine and KVM and VSOX are usually faster. So they record, everybody records their um, trace events like here the yellow and the green and the blue. And um, yeah, on your uh, controlling machine, you can hit a uh, thick end, control C, and then um, it will generate uh, trace one dead and trace two dead and trace three dead for every of your um, uh, no uh, machines. And it has as metadata the mentioned offset before, um, which uh, is your uh, time synchronization offset to block D. So next slide notes. We close the chapter now about what time synchronization is and how to get them. Every timeline shown in the next slides are time synchronized and we, uh, we don't mention anymore the offset. And we will look now how we can use it with the networking protocol DLM, the distributed log manager. So the distributed log manager, it's a networking protocol. It's exchange um, message. It's this in a cluster. So a cluster manager is um, required, which uh, forms a cluster with several machines, nodes in this case. And it has an asynchronous log API. What this means, I, I will show you up later. The logs have log modes. You only um, will look into the log modes um, Ex exclusive and parallel read, which is the same like writers and readers log. But uh, DLM has more logs. Uh, we don't look into them. And it works with log masters. What a log master is that uh, one machine in the in DLM, in the cluster, owns the log and maintains and uh, accept each log request and something like that. Uh, so, uh, DLM works with that. What exactly this means, I will also show you later. So for example, with the asynchronous log API, what this access means, we we using the mentioned uh, visualizing of the trace, uh, tracing of slot two, we have a timeline, we're making a log request here on the pin needle, then we're having a pending state, and then we get a complete handler. So the log request doesn't block and we get a complete handler, which uh, tells us the log request is complete. Then we are uh, in a specific log mode, in this case, exclusive, the writer's log, and then we can also do an, uh, another log request and so on. And it's again pending and it gets complete handler. And then we are, for example, in a read log. So um, before we looking closely more into uh, DLM, I will show you an example with uh, local locking. We have one machine, um, then one machine has log A and B. And now machines has nowadays uh, many CPUs. We have, we want to lock between um, mutual access between uh, CPUs and we have a lock request on this CPU and we um, getting the exclusive lock state here and another CPU too want also to make a lock request, but uh, it's getting in contention because um, the lock has already been used by CPU six. And then here we're getting an unlock and then contention is over and CPU two is granted. And lock six is uh, uh, CPU six uh, makes another lock request and so on. Here's also an example of a uh, application event, this makes a write to a source, which can be a linked list of the data structures or also a shared block device like GFS2 is doing and something like that. And um, yeah, so, and it goes on like um, that we're making several lock requests and um, we seeing different states and application events like read here when we are in the parallel read state and it's um, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, it will be visualized as dimensional topologies. And uh, in log B, the same thing is just the same, just with less CPUs. 
And we have also our application event where we want to write at this point. And uh, because we can, um, we having the exclusive log and so on. So about DLM, um, what I want to mention at first is I will explain the DLM cluster hierarchy. So we have a cluster, for example, here a three node cluster, which uh, has a communication between them. Um, they can exchange messages and you, you can have multiple clusters also. Then we have a, inside a, a cluster, a log space, and the log space can contain um, logs. And now we don't have CPUs anymore, we have machines. And uh, DLM making the, um, the mutual access between machines and not CPU. That's the most uh, different uh, thing, but I showed you in the uh, local trace. So we're making a log request there, and then it's sending message. Here's the error topology, which I showed them this message it changed to the log master, no uh, two, because it's the log master need to talk with the um, with the node two to get a uh, long log granted. And then you're having the pending and you are in a log state. And the same also for node three, which uh, need to talk with the log master. And also you can have different other logs and um, yeah, it, it goes on like this. So now when the log master um, does a log request, no message is necessary because uh, it need to um, ask itself if it wants to have the log granted. So a more detailed example is we having our DLM cluster hierarchy here and our nodes, which using log A and log B. And we having uh, log requests going on to, to node and we are getting the exclusive mm -hmm. log. We have our application event. We want to write something to node source and like this and yeah, it's going on like the CPU uh, example, just with machines and not CPUs anymore. But here I did something like uh, that, uh, uh, there's something wrong. Um, this cannot be happen because there's a, a parallel read and a writer and the reader's lock is incompatible with the writer's lock. Um, this, when this uh, situation happens, we have uh, clearly a bug in our locking mechanism and uh, yeah, we're fixing it. And yeah, this looks better because the reader's lock is compatible with our reader's lock. I mentioned this because um, later in future work, we want to look into this behavior that we can actually detect bugs in our implementation list is tracing thing. So also we can have uh, read um, application events and then it just for the log B, it looks the same, just um, only two logs, uh, two nodes using log B. So this is how uh, we visualizing uh, DLM, but uh, what is about this log two format? And this log two format has something there which I want to mention, which is timeline scaling. Is uh, SLOG2 format only a uh, JET and also file format? No, because they solved a problem in this very long record traced file. So when you have uh, a long time record tracing file and uh, they're going um, to two gigabytes or something like that. And um, you can imagine if you open that with a viewer, it's uh, it takes long to load this file into the viewer if you want to visualize everything as you opened the viewer. But they solving it by using a, a kind of level of detail, like in computer games, you have uh, your ego perspective and things which are far behind, they are not detailed, but things which are close to you, they are in a very detailed thing uh, view. And they're using our same mechanism here. 
So what they actually use is that they building the slot two file format is a tree structure and it does uh, partial reads. So when you open the slot two file, it doesn't read the full file file. It makes a summary of all topology, which I mentioned with the pin needle and something. It's a bigger pin needle it can, and it can only say, okay, there are thousand pin needles under the big, bigger pin needle. And then the user needs to zoom in into the viewer and you reach different levels, but you ever, and also in a, a, a different level order in your tree structure. And this makes it that it doesn't always fully read the, um, the full uh, trace file in this viewer. And you can zoom out and zoom in. And yeah, this is how they're solving the x-axis scaling, which is our time. And, uh, but what is about the y-axis scaling? And we, um, this is not solved. The y-axis um, scaling is our DLM hierarchy with the logs, which are being showed off on the nodes. It has also something else, which is the white chord map. The white chord map is a um, multidimensional array. And you can see um, this as uh, columns for the y-axis. Um, and it contains a mapping, a column mapping in a hierarchy order, and finally maps it to a line ID. Um, the DLM cluster hierarchy, we, we're using it to represent the dimensional DLM cluster hierarchy with the cluster and log space and logs and nodes. And here's an example how it works. For example, this is the, the log space, and then we having log uh, one and log two in this log space. And you can, you already see, you can build a hierarchy order here, a structure like this, if you do such, such, uh, Array filling up, and yeah, at the end of the end, like the last column need always to be the line ID which you want to put in there. Uh, there, and uh, here's for example the six uh, going on in this ending of the hierarchy uh, order, and yeah, this uh, this can be very long. Uh, big such uh, white chord map, and be using it for representing the DLM hierarchy structure. So DLM two slot two is the as I mentioned uh, the the bridge between Linux traces and slot two. Um, what we have as input are Linux traces, which we uh, created with the trace CMD command, and it's time synchronized. Synchronized. At first, we're analyzing it. We're having some Java bindings because log2 SDK is written in Java. And we uh, have some Java bindings to trace CMD to pass them. And it gives the user, at first, uh, an overview about all log logs which are appearing in this uh, Linux trace files. Then the user can filter out traces which are interesting for him because that's our way to scale for the y-axis. Um, yeah, currently that's our way. And then we generate this log2 five file. That means we're interpreting all these log states and all the pin needles and all the arrows which are going on. And we also generate the y chord map to um, generate the DLM hierarchy. And as output, we have this log2 trace format, trace file. So this is how it looks like. Here on the top, we're having Linux traces, which has uh, maybe put the, uh, the node ID map to uh, a trace file, which was recorded when DLM was running. Then we're having here the available um, log resources, the available logs, and the user can filter out logs, which are interesting for him. And then we can generate and uh, the slot two file, which uh, interpreting all the states and can uh, and uh, generates the file. So this is how it looks like. The good thing how it looks like is that um, it looks like, as I mentioned it earlier, um, 
in this presentation about the pin needle and the rectangle state and the arrow arrows. We have here the legend, which uh, looks a little bit more complex than I showed you up here in this presentation, because of course, uh, DLM is more complex uh, than I showed you. Then we have in, uh, the white chord map here on the on the bottom, which says lock space or so, uh, yeah, resource, that's the lock and the node. So we're having the lock, lock space here. So this is a lock space and we're having a specific lock and then we're having the nodes which using the specific locks. And here we're having the timelines which are blue and uh, uh, the events which are the pin needles here, for example, the complete event and then we are having the exclusive lock here um, state which is the rectangle coming up. And then we are also having the arrows which um, shows communication with the lock masters. And yeah, we can visualize our um, lock protocol in such a way. Here's an example of a non-zoom preview. And this is exactly what I mentioned. Because um, when you just open the slot 2 file, it's the level of detail. You need to zoom into it because it summarized the topology, which I mentioned before. And this is how they scale for a very long time uh, time record file uh, of the Linux traces. If you recorded it for one day or something, it, it, it will not read the full uh, slot 2 trace file. So future work, um, yeah, it is, at first, is uh, what I would like to do is the continuous kind of integration because what I showed you before with the um, incompatible lock modes where there was a reader's lock and a writer's lock, and we having some DLM lock torture test, which only making some locking operations and we tracing them at the same time and we uh, putting them in a time synchronized way. Um, we can actually look for incompatible lock modes. And if they occur, we can say, okay, test, fa uh, test failed. And uh, somebody need to look into that and can also uh, get a slot two file format and look, uh, see where, uh, where the incompatible lock modes were, where happened. And yeah, the, this would be the first thing that I build something like a verifier uh, for it um, to verify that uh, DLM is working correctly uh, as point of the view, uh, user's view of uh, DLM API. And an another thing would be, but I don't know if it really uh, tracing can be used here. It's uh, one time kernel optimization. I can see something like predict locking and then uh, switch the lock master to a specific mode that uh, network communication is more less than before. Uh, as you see, when one uh, node is doing a lot of lock requests at one specific time, um, it would be nice to have it as a lock master because uh, then it doesn't need to generate a lot of uh, network communication anymore. And I think over a uh, separate control and data pass, and control pass is uh, doing the tracing. We could collect statistics and then uh, changing some uh, kernel parameters, which is just a daemon in the uh, in user space, which running and changing some uh, kernel parameters if they are necessary. Or another example, but I don't know if this is uh, if it makes any sense or something like that. But uh, if you have uh, networking queues, queue disks, they have also specific parameters. And when you want to follow the uh, networking flows, you can use SKB marks on it. And this is your SKB mark is the unique identifier in your networking. To uh, see your networking flows, you collect uh, time synchronized traces and then doing uh, uh, 
parameter optimizations that would be allow us to um, change uh, QDisk parameters in a distributed not uh, in a distributed um, network. Um, as somebody see the um, the networking behavior in a chronological order, and I I don't know I I, I would like to experiment a little bit out of this, but this also requires that we uh, need to have time synchronization uh, feature on a live trace uh, live recording, which is I think not currently supported by trace CMD. Yeah, and but these are one other ideas which is um, apart from the debugging case, which can be used for some something like that for one-time kernel optimization, which came into my mind. Yeah, and yeah, thanks for the, thanks. And uh, thanks for listening to my talk. And here, if you want to know more, here's the GitLab page where I uploaded everything. And yeah, thanks. Any questions? Any questions? You're live in case you wanted to add anything, Alex. Um, yeah. Thanks again for listening to my talk. And uh, you can write me emails if you are interested into that. I can answer your questions or now if you have some questions. Yeah, could we get a mic over? Okay, so you mentioned that you are uh, synchronizing time using either PTP or KVM, but do you mean like you synchronize the system time or, or use the uh, timestamps from PTP as, as somehow the conversion rate between one lock or an, and another, or, or how does that work? The, and this is uh, very specific to Trace MD. And uh, what I think is they're using the the uptime at first, and then they're making, uh, they um, doing um, I think it's the first uptime which they get, and then they calculating the offset of it. Uh, but uh, what you can do is I think they can also put the um, time of date in as metadata into the Linux trace files. And, I guess if you want to have your own uh, behavior there, then you can send it upstream to Lace Trace CMD and they uh, look into that um, what they want. But uh, currently, it's uh, the uptime of. Okay, so they use basically the clock monotonic, and then they translate or convert it somehow to the to the time scale, the universal one that comes from either the PTP or KVM clock, right? Yeah, yeah, they have different kind of clock sources, but this is only, as far as I understand, uh, the method of um, uh, of how you want to time synchronize your um, traces. But, uh, but the actually time uh, stamp represent Represent it's very trace CMD specific. Yes. Okay. And for logs, do you also use the timestamps some, somehow, or you just uh, oh. communicate and they, no. they they have some expiry time, or or they just you just need to unlock them after you are done. For the logs, um, there's actually a null log 
mode, which uh, is a unlock mode, and you can also unlock an uh, a lock. But this this has something to do with uh, dealing with the lifetime of a lock because when you using the null lock, it's still alive. But if you unlock a node, then it will be in a garbage collector and will be freed up. But uh, there is no, um, there's no, we don't have any time synchronized tra uh, tracking in the DLM protocol yet. But, uh, okay. okay, thanks. Anybody else? Let me just check on the brief. So, a few more interesting about uh, time synchronized traces. I mean, uh, TraceEMD is uh, open source. You can look into it. And they're having this feature recently added. Thank you, Alex. If there are no more questions, we'll take a very short break and resume in six minutes. Thank you. Thank you.